All right, we're back, and we're in the uh, in Acts chapter number thirteen, and we're going to pick up in verse number fourteen. I'm on page one hundred and sixty-five of the notebook right now. In fact, the title that I placed on this particular session is "What Must I Do to Believe?" Or I could put it this way: "What must I believe to believe?" What does a person really have to know and believe? about trust in Christ as Savior. So this is a little bit, a little bit of a sidelight here, but very, very important, I think, for us as Christian individuals. I noted in the last session uh, the statement, well, all you have to do is ask Jesus into your heart. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, just ask for Jesus to come into your heart. Those words are not found in that particular order. Now, I could find all of those words in the New Testament, I think, but I couldn't find that order to be a directive in how a person should be saved. In fact, I'm not sure that any one passage of Scripture in the New Testament tells us everything we need to know about being a Christian. So we need to be careful about that. I think uh, Acts chapter 16, uh, what must I do to be saved, that's the most direct question. And then the answer to that is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But that demands some explanation. And in this particular session, we're going to spend some time in doing that. Now, as we get into chapter number 13, we're in, uh, uh, we're following Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey of three. He's going to cover, they're going to cover about 900 miles uh, during this particular journey before they go back to Antioch and report on what they have done and what they have found. So let's pick things up here in, uh, on page 165 in uh, your uh, notebook. 165. Let's begin at the reading uh, down uh, about two-thirds of the way down the page. Arrival at Pisidian Antioch. This is different from Antioch of, of Syria. Acts 13, verse 14. But when they departed from Perge, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. What an invitation this is. Apparently, uh, obviously, they were open to hear what they had to say. I don't know if they knew who they were, if they came with references or what. I don't know what they expected. But they have an invitation and they have an opportunity to speak. Acts chapter 13, 14, and 15. So, what happens then is in verse number 15, we, we read, Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. And what Paul is going to do is he's going to give a uh, history lesson, a Jewish or Israelite history lesson to the people. Uh, Peter has done this earlier in the book of Acts. Stephen did this in Acts chapter number 7. Now, Paul the Apostle is going to give the people at uh, uh, Pisidian Antioch, he's going to give them a history lesson and, of course, bring it to some kind of therefore and conclusion. Then Paul stood up. He said, Men of Israel, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. So you can see the history. In fact, if you look across the page, we've taken each one of these verses and uh, we've mentioned the historical event or events that Paul is referring to in this sermon from verses 16 on. So it says there that uh, God, the God of this people of Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought them, he the, them out of it. In about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. That's the book of Numbers. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. 
That's Joshua. And after that, he gave them judges about the space of 450 years. That's judges until 1 Samuel, the Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king, 2 Samuel, or 1st and 2 Samuel, of course, and gave unto them Saul. At the end of 1 Samuel, Saul dies. And then 2 Samuel is all about King David. So afterward, verse 21, they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them, 2 Samuel, David is mentioned in 1 Samuel, but we see his reign in 2 Samuel, raised unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed, important statement here, that is David, of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So Jesus is going to be of the family of David. And David is of the family of Judah. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. That's verse 24. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me. I'm not the Messiah, but there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Obviously a reference to Jesus. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of his salvation sent. For they <clears throat> that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So we see, continuing through uh, this passage, we see that Paul is introducing or reminding these, uh, this, his Jewish audience and others of the history of the nation of Israel. So he's going to bring this to some kind of a conclusion, but he continues, verse 28, And though they found no cause of death in him, that is in Jesus, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when he had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down. In other words, there were many things written and prophesied in the Old Testament, and Christ came to fulfill them, and Paul is emphasizing that. And when they had, had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. I think it's interesting there in verse 29 to note, they had fulfilled all. That is, all of this this isn't just what Jesus did himself. So he was in total control, and I'm prophesied to do this, and I'm prophesied to do that, and I'm supposed to do this to fulfill all of this. It's the people that surrounded the life of Jesus. They were prophesied that they would deal with this situation in a certain way, and they did. And consequently, they, along with the life of Christ, fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. Not just Jesus orchestrating the fulfillment himself. So we pick this up in uh, uh, verse number, oh, let's see, we'll pick it up in verse number 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher, a grave, but God raised him from the dead, the resurrection. The resurrection is the linchpin of Christianity. If Jesus is not risen, then we of all people are most miserable. This whole thing of Christianity just falls flat on its face. It's all about Christ crucified, buried, he died and was literally buried, and he rose out of that grave. That's the key. If he didn't come forth, he's no different than any other leader of any other religious movement in the history of mankind because they are all dead. 
Jesus is not. He's God manifest in the flesh, and Jesus rose from the dead. Verse 30, and he was seen many days. There are 12 individual separate references in the New Testament to the resurrection that is in the Gospels to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is sightings, appearances of Christ, uh, like the appearance to the women at the gravesite, like the appearance to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, like the disciples um, at, uh, at the, uh, at the, in John chapter 20 where doubting Thomas shows up. Those are just three. Paul says that he, the resurrected Christ, was seen of above 500 witnesses after his crucifixion, his burial, and resurrection, 500 plus people actually saw him. And Paul says that many of those people are still alive and with us today. Check it out. Go talk to them. It would have been very easy to disprove the resurrection of Christ with so many different witnesses. There would have been conflicting testimonies. There would have been people who were, uh, uh, who were um, disputing about this. But there seems to be, and as I read through the Gospels, the book of Acts, I see no disputing whatsoever. Plenty of proof. He was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Obviously, this is a reference uh, to Christ, even though it's written a thousand years before his birth. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, to the grave, he said to be resurrected forevermore, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. These psalms are uh, mentioned and referenced in the notes that follow, by the way. For he... Uh, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. David saw corruption, but Jesus did not. But, who, but he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. He was risen eternally. Eternally. He lives today. So what you see there on page 167, we've just kind of taken these verses and then made reference or showed the reference to what Paul is talking about as he's bringing forth this history of the nation of Israel to uh, the people, these men of Israel, verse number 15 of this chapter. So we can turn the page and we can see all of this uh, spelled out. We can see the quotes from um, the Old Testament that are referenced there on page 168. And we come down to about two-thirds of the way down the page. We read this after 1337. But the very fact that the Old Testament predicted the crucifixion of Messiah is phenomenal. Crucifixion was not a Jewish, Jewish form of execution, if indeed it was even known in Old Testament times. Yet Psalm 22, Numbers 21, surely picture just such a death, a death by crucifixion. And then God raised him from the dead. Several references there to that effect. In case you thought that was a gloss or an error in the New Testament, that is referred to many, many times throughout the book of Acts and obviously recorded in the Gospels. So then Paul brings, brings the invitation in verses 38 through 41. We talk about invitations, we talk about preaching the gospel, we talk about coming to the end of the message and drawing some conclusions. And then what we do oftentimes as ministers, as preachers, as teachers, we go to the people and say, now what are you going to do about it? 
Or, maybe better, what are we going to do about what the Bible says and what I've just preached? Now, those of you who do not know Christ as Savior, allow me to share with you just for a moment what that means. Now, we need to be very careful when we do that because this is usually happening toward the end of the sermon and we're kind of looking at the clock and we're trying to figure out, boy, how much time do I have? I got about two minutes to present the gospel to these people. So, what am I going to say? Or maybe better yet, what am I not going to say? So we have to be careful. We have to be careful. When we have invitations in church, in seat, come forward, whatever they are, mass evangelism, whenever we have invitations, we need to be very, very careful about leading people to Christ. We don't want to misinform people. We don't want to mislead people. We don't want people to get a false sense of security that because they prayed the prayer, they're okay. What must I do to be saved? What must I believe to be saved? When we say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house, what does that mean? What are all of the implications of a question like that? Look at 1338. We'll be back and we'll talk about this. Be it known unto you, bottom of 168, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Justification cleared, complete clearing. The Old Testament did not clear Ezekiel 34, 7, or not Ezekiel, Exodus 34, 7, I believe makes some kind of a reference to that. But being justified before God only can take place when a person's sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That didn't take place in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, sin was covered, not eliminated. Sin was covered. The blood served as a covering, a temporary covering for sin. But the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, God's son, cleanses from all sin. Verse 40, Beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Oh my, what a prophecy. You're going to, it's going to be preached to you. You're going to get it right between the eyes and you're, going to, and you're going to reject it. It's going to be as plain as the nose on some of your faces, but you're going to reject it. Through this man, 1338 is preached unto you. What are the implications of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? What are they? Now, the response to the invitation here on 42 and 43. Acts 13.42 says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. Obviously, he's getting a good response from these people. It doesn't mean that they got saved. It does mean that he got their attention. I'm not an example. Uh, this is an example because it's in the Bible. But I might say that this is how I dealt with all of this. I was not interested when I was first witnessed uh, to. I wasn't interested. I politely listened to the soul winner, to the evangelist, to the minister of reconciliation, to the fisher of men. I politely listened, and I hoped he would go away, and he did. Whew. But he came back. And he went away. And he came back. And he went away. And he came back. And he gave me a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. And I had to intellectually and spiritually chew on what he was telling me. And I remember one day starting to get it. And I made mention to a third party, I said, you know, 
something, some of the things he says really do make sense. That was God's Holy Spirit working in my heart through his word. I was beginning to get it. If I was sitting in a church service and I heard that message for the first time sitting there, I wouldn't have understood it. I just didn't get it. I couldn't wait to get out of that service. Where my friend invited me, I came to the Christmas special, I heard what they had to say, now I'm getting out of here. I did what you asked me to do, don't bother me again. That may have been my reaction, knowing where I was as a 20-year-old uh, individual. Well, if you notice there toward the bottom of 169 application, the most important decision a person may make in his or her life has to be the decision to accept or reject the claims of Scripture and the Lord Jesus Christ. So right here, I want to get into just a brief discussion. I've got a few moments now to talk about this issue of what must I believe to believe? What must I do to be saved? What have I got? What do I need to know? I believe at the center of all of this is the identity of Jesus. I think we begin by answering these questions. So if you turn the page, now I know you're going to look at this probably and say, man, this is a lot of stuff. We're living with people today in a postmodern culture that don't believe any of the stuff that's written on pages 170 or 171. They don't believe any of this. They think it's a bunch of poppycock, fairy tale, religious stuff for Sunday school kids, antiquated, out of date, something for grandma and grandpa, but not for them. And they're, they're not being taught this in school. They're not being taught this at home. They're not being taught this in the media. Where are people being taught anything about Jesus other than going to a church that has some belief in the Bible and Christianity and they're getting some Sunday school lessons. And even then you wonder how in-depth are those lessons coming in. But the media and education and all of these areas that are where we have getting input, none of them are focusing and concentrating on giving people scriptural or spiritual or biblical information. You say, well, there's Christian radio, but who listens to Christian radio other than Christians? Very few non-Christians listen, listen to Christian radio. So, here's the questions. These are the things. Now, you can take this for what it's worth. You may think that I'm too extreme, that I'm being picky, but I'm much more comfortable when I lead someone to Christ, when I've had the opportunity to deal with and to explain these things, make sure people understand what I'm talking about, particularly when they have no biblical background whatsoever. So who was Jesus? I think there's some important things on there. He, was, he led a sinless life. Now, I don't know that people need to understand uh, physiologically the virgin birth, but if the question comes up, the virgin birth has everything to do with the divinity of Christ. So one of the proofs of his divinity or his deity is the way, the unique way in which he was conceived and born. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, right. What does that mean? Well, people need an explanation. Go back to the scriptures and show them. Go back to the scriptures. In fact, what I would encourage you to do is take the list of things that I have here and to the right of each one of them, pencil in a scripture verse that proves each one of these. I probably should have done that myself when I put these notes together. But you can do that. Do a little exercise. Who was Jesus? What did he do? What did he do? This would serve as a good foundation for a Bible track, would it not? What did he do? He lived a sinless, perfect life. He never sinned. He died on the cross and shed his blood as a sacrifice for the sins of men. He rose from the dead and in so doing conquered sin and death. And then he ascended into heaven. By the way, 
I could probably say more about each one of those things. What must I believe to believe? How much of this does a person understand? Well, don't cut it short. More is better, not less. More is better. Cutting some of this stuff out or leaving people confused as to what the virgin birth is or what is eternal life or any of these things or was, is uh, the resurrection, was this a literal, physical, bodily resurrection? Is that true? Or is this just a spiritual concept or idea that the New Testament has? These are the kinds of questions that lost people will ask, particularly in a culture like ours today where they are not being instructed in biblical truth. Why did he do it? The bottom of page 170. And then what must I do? Or must, what must we do? We must believe that we are sinners, separated from God, and will be judged accordingly. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. We are hopelessly lost without Christ's forgiveness and salvation. In other words, he is the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said, John 14, 6. We must believe that God in his, uh, and his scriptures, we must believe God that he is, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, we have to have faith in God. We have to trust God and the scriptures, and we need to understand the importance of repentance a turning from sin and a turning to Christ. Repentance is often omitted in people's witnessing attempts to try to bring people to Christ. Repent. We must believe who Christ was, what he did, and why he did it. We must trust him completely for forgiveness and reject all human effort. My biggest problem in getting saved was human effort. I believe that I could help him. I really did. I could be a good religious person. I could help Jesus save me. So I put a lot of stock in what I did. I put a lot of stock in my church attendance and my sacraments and my prayers and the fact that I was a good and almost perfect individual. That really helped me get accepted with him. I had to get past that. I had to realize that I was hopelessly lost without him hopelessly lost we've got to trust him completely we must call upon his name i put three words here you've probably seen this before acknowledge i've got to have the knowledge of the truth i've got to acknowledge the factual truth of scripture okay then i must assent to it not only do I understand these are the facts of Scripture, but I agree that they are factual. I assent. I accept the factualness of these statements. And then appropriate. I make them mine. Jesus died for the whole world. That's true. John 3.16. But he died for me. I must repent. I must believe. I must call upon his name. I must understand who he is, what he did, why he did it. And I might add the consequences of not believing and call upon his name to be saved. An inner realization of guilt for one's own sin and a need for forgiveness. What I've done is I've kind of spelled some of this stuff out and what must we do to believe you can see the emboldened print on 171 at the bottom of the page. The emphasis is on Jesus Christ. But the proclamation of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection never ends with simply telling. It's not enough to believe the truths of the statement or the story, for even the devil believes we know from James. The truth becomes truly true when it is embraced by the whole or the essence of one's being. Its telling is for the purpose of provoking a response, though its telling ought never to be coercive. We need to be careful. Yes, if you don't trust Jesus Christ as Savior, 
you'll die and you'll go to hell. That's a factual statement. But we need to be careful that we don't say that in a threatening way, that our emotion provokes the response rather than the fact of the statement provokes the response. It's important. Either the message of the good news will gain a hold or it will fall on deaf ears. It is never the duty of the proclaimer of truth to force one, one to a decision. That is the work of the Spirit. I witnessed to a man this past summer. I started witnessing to him late in August. I did not know him. Byron was his name. He was a 74-year-old man. But he was interested in salvation. So he was seeking some people I knew asked me if I would come alongside and share the gospel with him. I did. I did. I did on a Saturday afternoon, and I spent about two hours with him face to face. I mean, this far apart, witnessing to him. He asked me questions. I tried to answer them. I was very paid. I have never been involved in a witnessing exchange like I was. So intense. After two hours, he wasn't convinced. I said, I could talk to you tomorrow. Would that be all right? He said, sure, come on back. So we met the next day for an hour and a half. I spent three and a half hours with this man. Now, he had a religious background, kind of a multifaceted religious background, which is probably more of a hindrance than a help. But nonetheless, I spent three and a half hours face to face with a man who was seeking the truth and I gave him the best answers and I was patient, praying about all of this and at the end of three and a half hours, he didn't get saved. He had to leave town and I might never see him again in this life. I said, Byron, we could continue this discussion if you would like. We could continue this discussion uh, over email and so we did we exchanged emails several times and he still had questions and I was I have to admit I was getting a little frustrated there were other people who were involved in this who were praying for me and praying for him they would come to by the way I didn't tell you this but he had a brain tumor he had already had surgery he had already been through chemotherapy and he had already had radiation and he was given 30 days to live so I'm feeling the um, urgency of the moment to try to help him. Three and a half hours, eight email exchanges back and forth, he wasn't saved. I answered every question to the best of my ability, and he wasn't saved. And then I didn't hear from him. I didn't hear from him for a couple weeks. I sent him this paragraph from the bottom of page 171. I said, this is what this is all about. This is what this is all about. So the issues that are on these two pages, 170, 171, but I sent him this paragraph. About a week later, he wrote to me. He said, I get it. I get it. I got it. Thank you for being patient with me. I'm taking your time. Three weeks later, he died. That's a true story. That's a true story that happened to me just last, at the end of last year. He died, I think, November or December somewhere. He lived longer than 30 days. He lived about 90 days. Thank God that he lived 90 days, but he's in heaven today. Let's stop right now. We'll take a break, and we'll come back, and we're going to go into chapter number 14, we're continuing in Paul's first missionary journey. We'll be, in, we'll be at the end of chapter 13 and into chapter number 14. I entitled this next session or section, No One Said It Would Be Easy. Boy, if there is an, an illustration example of that, it certainly is Paul the Apostle. So let's get through uh, in our next session We'll try to get through all of chapter number 14, and we will finish Paul's first missionary journey. Take a break.